Good afternoon. I would like to call this meeting to order, and I would like to welcome everyone to the October 5th, 2015 work session for the Gaston County Board of Education. I'm Kenny Lutz, Chairman, and to my left is Mr. Ramsey, Vice Chair at large. I would like to introduce our board members at this time, to, starting from my right, Mr. Dedman, Gastonia Township, Chris Howe, South Point Township, Mark Upchurch, Charitable Township, Catherine Roberts, Dallas Township, Doc Guthrie, Gastonia Township, Kevin Collier, River Bend Township, Doc Cherry at large. On behalf of the board, I would like to welcome everyone here to this meeting. And our first order of a business tonight will be to adopt the agenda, but I would like to have a moment to um, make a statement. I would like for us all to take a moment of silence to be with the Iredale, Iredale Statesville School District as they suffered a tragedy with some of their students on Saturday uh, during a um, Saturday activity with the band at a band program. So if we could just take for a minute and just have a moment of silence, I would appreciate it. Thank you. At this time, I would like for everyone uh, would need to adopt the agenda. And if everyone's had a chance to look at it, um, I will need that in the form of a motion. Miss Cherry. Um, I that we adopt the agenda. Right. All right, I have a motion for adoption of the agenda. Do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Collier has second. Any discussion? All in favor? And it is unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, our next item will be National Prin Principals Appreciation Month, and I would like to ask Todd Hagens, our Chief Communications Officer, to come forward to present this resolution, resolution for the board to consider. Good evening, Chairman Lutz, Vice Chairman Ramsey, members of the board, and Superintendent Booker. October is National Principals Appreciation Month. The annual observance is sponsored by the National Association of Elementary School Principals and the National Association of Secondary School Principals. This year, we have a resolution to present to you for consideration. At this time, I would like to read the resolution for our audience and the people watching online and on Channel 21. This is a Gaston County Schools resolution for National Principals Month, whereas the month of October is designated National Principals Month in recognition of all school administrators and their diligent efforts to ensure that every child receives a quality education. And whereas principals and assistant principals are commended for taking on the responsibility of establishing high standards, leading the instructional program, acting as disciplinarians, developing strategies to facilitate continuous improvement, and overseeing the day-to-day -day operation of their school. And whereas principals and assistant principals are key to establishing a positive tone for their school and maintaining relationships with students, parents, teachers, and school personnel, the community, and others to ensure academic excellence for children in a safe, healthy, and supportive school environment. And whereas we are extremely proud of the principals and assistant principals at our 55 schools and sincerely appreciate their steadfast commitment and contributions to Gaston County Schools and public education in North Carolina. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Gaston County Board of Education joins other boards of education across the United States in recognizing October 2015 as National Principals Month and encourages the citizens of Gaston County to thank all school administrators for the care and concern they show for our children and also to express appreciation for the outstanding job our principals and assistant principals do each day to inspire success and a lifetime of learning in Gaston County Schools. At your regular meeting on October the 19th, you will have the resolution on the agenda for approval. Also, representatives from the Gaston County Schools Principals Leadership Team will be at that meeting to accept the resolution. And if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Any you. questions? Questions? Thank, Thank you. you very much. The next item on the agenda is the Google Apps for Education, and I will ask Ms. Matson to come forward. Good 
Good evening, Chairman Lutz, Board of Education members, and Superintendent Booker. I'm very happy to have some special guests with us this evening. First of all, we're going to talk about Google Apps for Education, but the two people standing behind me are a few of our instructional technology facilitators, or often called an ITF. I want you to understand a little bit about the services they provide to our district. They help teachers plan. Uh, and assist with integrating technology into their lesson plans. They model technology-rich environments. They mentor the teachers. They advise on technology purchases. And they assist administrators with technology tools for administrative tasks. Currently, our ITFs each serve about 200 teachers. I have with me this evening also our Assistant Chief Technology Officer, Roxy Miller. And behind me, Jason Mamano. Jason has been in education for 16 years. He was a special ed teacher before becoming an instructional technology facilitator in 2007. As an ITF, Jason serves at the secondary level and at Webb Street. Jason holds a master's degree in instructional technology. Teresa is in her 25th year in education. As a classroom teacher for 15 years, she taught kindergarten, first, second, fourth, and fifth grade, and has served as an ITF since 2006. She holds national board certification. She has an instructional facilitator techno She's been a member of our team for, uh, for six elementary schools, and she holds a master's degree in elementary education, instructional technology, and is also certified in AIG. And I have the privilege tonight to start off telling you about our Google Apps for Education. When you think of Google, you often think of searching. It's the first thing that comes to your mind. And we often use Google it when we want someone to find something. But in Gaston County Schools, Google Apps for Education is so much more than just searching. It provides us a suite of productivity tools from our email to our calendar to a whole suite of other apps, including Google Classroom, that our students and our teachers are able to do phenomenal things with. Part of that suite is what we call Google Drive. Think of that as a 21st century book bag. It's a free book bag with unlimited storage and it's ultra secure. So our students are able to store as many documents and artifacts as they need to, as well as our teachers. Google Apps will also work on any platform, whether it's a Chromebook, an iDevice, an Android, or a PC tablet. And teachers no longer have to wait for a technician to show up in their classroom to install software. Everything is available right in the cloud, right at the moment that they need it. And how many of you have worked on a computer before and you thought you saved your work and you went back and, oops, it was no longer there, or right in the middle, your computer crashes. Well, with Google Apps for Education, Google saves every five seconds, so we don't have to worry about that. And it's automatically saved for us, our students, and our teachers. We've also always sent a document for someone to work on, and at some point, we will have bazillion versions out there, and we never know which one is the correct one. Now we send students and teachers to the document and they all can work collaboratively within that one environment. And not only can they work on the document, but they also can discuss that document right within the document itself. So they have great collaboration and learning taking place right away. And we are a leader in Gaston County Schools in Google Apps for Education, and we're in good company. As you can see, 85% of the districts of North Carolina are in Google Apps for Education. And Jason will now come and tell you about our Chromebooks. All right. <clears throat> so for Gaston County Schools, the perfect device for computing is the Chromebook. The uh, for probably three through 12th grade. And it, it, it mirrors perfectly with Google Apps for Education. Without the Google Apps for Education, the Chromebook would not be the perfect device. I'm gonna go through some of the benefits of the Chromebook. And we have two of them right there. 
Uh, so battery life. As a secondary teacher, I would teach three classes, uh, 90 minutes each. And I remember that first time we got that first laptop cart, we tried so hard and raised so much money to get that first laptop cart. And then that first time we plugged it in, I used it with students. I made it through my first period class, no problem. Second period class, the batteries start to die. So there is an issue there with longevity of battery. The Chromebook has 10 hours plus, right? So that's going to get me through an entire day of school and then some, right, without charging. Instantly on. With that, with that laptop, it, you, you turn it on. It takes a minute or two to boot up. You have to log into Novell. With the Chromebook, you open the Chromebook, and it, it's instantly on within three seconds. I can turn it off as well just by closing or hitting the power button. And unlike a PC, it can quickly turn off as well. So, Teresa mentioned no software to install. The students have this device, it's basically a shell. They log in with their Google account, right? And they, they can go to the web store, the teacher can go to the web store, and there are thousands and thousands of free applications on there. And the students can log into those applications just like they would an app on an iPad, and each one of them uses the Google login. So, one username and one password for all of that. And Previously, before we had that, we were using some of the same applications and the kids would forget their passwords. Um, but you have that one username and password you use every day, you're, you're more than likely not going to forget it. Um, there are no viruses on a Chromebook. It is the only operating system without any viruses. It instantly updates. Uh, uh, so when you turn it on, unlike your phone that asks you to update, the Chromebook automatically updates to ensure that any vulnerabilities, the number one uh, vulnerability in a PC is Java. That's where most of the viruses come from, and Chrome doesn't run Java at all. So that largest vulnerability has been completely removed from the, app, uh, from the operating system. This is the best part. The cost of a Chromebook is under $200. So it's a very affordable device where we can buy an entire Chromebook cart for under $10,000 compared to a laptop cart in the $30,000 range. It's also very affordable for parents and students. Students could even save up enough money to buy their own Chromebook uh, or parents as well. It's, a, it's an affordable device. Shareable. That device, if, if uh, Dr. Abernathy turns, puts the power button down on that device and hands it to me, all of our information is completely logged out. It is completely secure. I can log in, and when I put in my Google Apps for Education username and password, it becomes my Chromebook, and all my information comes over, my applications, my extensions, it becomes my Chromebook. I hit the power button, the next person logs in, it becomes theirs. It's instantly shareable. So it's a great, uh, great for classrooms in, in the cart setting like you see in the photograph here. Google Classroom, this is amazing. Uh, learning management systems. So we have teachers that are going off back to college and they're going into these learning management systems. All these students are going off to college and they have a component of their learning is online. Would you, have you heard this? You know, when kids go off to school, the first time I, when my child goes off to school, I don't want him to experience a learning management system. Uh, uh, uploading assignments for grades, those kinds of things. Uh, Google Classroom is a learning management system uh, that is simplified, and it's, it's it built into every single one of our Google Apps for Education. And we have over 90% of our teachers utilizing some component of the Google Classroom. It is truly amazing to see this in action. Instructionally, these are pictures of students in Gaston County that were taken last week. Here we have a couple elementary students on the right-hand side collaborating together. And then on the left-hand side, the Chromebooks are very, very mobile, sitting down on the carpet using the devices. We're in good company. We are a leader in the Google Apps for Education in North Carolina, but uh, in education, the number one selling device is the Chromebook. And in business for the first time this year, the Chromebook has surpassed Windows PCs. In fact, this year, the Chromebook has surpassed, the, the number of Chromebooks has surpassed the number of all other computing devices in, in the schools, Macs, PCs, and iPads. We have some other special guests with us, too. I would like to thank Mr. Denton for joining us to support his teacher and his students this evening. Also, I'd like to introduce Ms. Catherine Letterman. Ms. Letterman is a fifth grade te uh, is a fifth year teacher at Cramerton Middle School. She teaches sixth grade language arts and social studies and is part of the Gaston County Schools Pinnacle Technology Leadership Program. Ms. Leatherman believes the power of technology coupled with the passion of dedicated teachers can support and prepare students for success in school and in the future. I also want to take a moment to introduce the students that you'll be seeing in just a minute. 
Ryan is a sixth grader at Cramerton Middle School. He is a class student council representative and enjoys playing soccer. Ryan's favorite thing about middle school so far is being able to change classes and have a different teacher throughout the day. Elizabeth is a sixth grader at Cramerton Middle School as well. She is a class student council representative alternate and is an avid reader who plans to participate in the school's Battle of the Books program. Elizabeth's favorite thing about middle school so far is having more freedom. Good evening. I'm just here to share a little bit about the teacher's perspective and then I'll call my students up to share the um, student perspective of how Google Apps and how Chromebooks have transformed our learning. This first slide just gives a piece of how Chromebooks and Google Apps have redefined education for me and my classroom and for the students, some of the skills that the students walk away having learned being able to manipulate the tools and the resources that they're giving through Google. And I wanted to focus on three ways that my teaching has been transformed in just my few short years of being a teacher. The first one is personalized learning. With Google, I am able to give each student exactly what they need. Students can move on to new material when they're ready, while other students can work on relearning the material that they may have missed. And this is made possible through Google Forms, Google Docs, um, collaboration with other students. They are not held back, and I'm meeting each student at their individual level instead of just the whole class holding their hand with me the whole time. They're able to move on and kind of flex their learning to best meet their own needs. The second way that Google has transformed my classroom is through grading and conferencing. And like Jason mentioned, with Google Classroom, Google Classroom is an incredible tool that I have um, come to use almost daily in my classroom and one of the reasons is because I can get grades back and feedback to students very quickly. They can see what they missed, what they um, achieved, they can reevaluate, they can reflect on their own learning sometimes the same day as an assignment. I can also in real time pull up assignments they're working on at the back pull over one student that I can see their document as they're working and know that I need to touch base with them and work on punctuation or adding more details to their writing. And so I can pull those students back, show them on my device, here's where you're doing a good job, maybe here we can try adding something. And those students who are just moving on and excelling, they don't have to be bothered, they can stay in the zone and keep working. And so that real time allows me to, again, meet each student and really address their individual needs. One of the last ways that I wanted to touch on on uh, the transformation in my classroom is real-time collaboration. This is something that has um, just transformed, redefined how I work with others in the county. One thing that I really like about Gaston County is it has a very uh, community feel. It's a large county, but everywhere I go I meet somebody that has a connection to somebody else that I know. And Google has made that even more real. Um, currently, sixth grade language arts teachers in Gaston County are using the Lucy Calkins writing curriculum. And we are working as a uh, professional learning community in our hallway of sixth grade teachers, but also collaborating with teachers from schools like Chavis and Mount Holly. We have a folder that we share on Google Drive. And as you can see in the picture, there are um, five presentations. And I have worked on one. Another teacher from Chavis worked on a, def a different one. Another teacher at my school on a third. And then the same with the fourth and the fifth. And so we're all collaborating together. We're sharing the wealth. We're sharing our knowledge. We are expanding the, the people that we can rely on, the people we can collaborate with. And at the end of the day, that is all benefiting my students because I'm not only using what I know about education, but what all these other teachers know in the county. Um, I can also collaborate with my teammate in real time and we have records that we share in a folder. So student communication, things that we need to have on hand in our own classrooms, we can share. We don't have to pass back and forth binders. Um, it makes everything a little easier and a little quicker, which again saves time, time that we can use spending with our students. And so Google has really um, changed my focus and now my focus while it's always been the students, it's really spending time with the students and getting to know them and getting to talk to them 
and doing what's best for each individual instead of just kind of a blanket statement of what do sixth graders need, it's what does Ryan need, what does Elizabeth need. Um, and I'm going to pass it off to one of my students and they're going to share a little bit about what they have learned. Um, I think about Google Classroom, it is more organized and um, it's easier to get from site to site and you have faster feedback and it makes it feel more professional. And um, Google works with other sites, so you don't really have to remember passwords or you can like use different sites at your own pace. Yeah. I think Chromebooks are good because they can be used any time in the day during school whenever you need them. Um, they make you feel a lot more professional than carrying around heavy textbooks. Um, they're a lot more personalized and they're easier to go to files and do your work. And with different websites you can do a lot more than you can do with a lot of different books. And then um, the apps in Google, they make it a lot easier to find the different websites. You don't have to type in a bunch of stuff. And it's a lot easier to share and work with the other students. And then, um, yeah, that's. Um, do any of you have any questions for me or either of the students? Any questions? Uh, OK. OK. And this is for the students. <coughs> We're glad that y'all are enjoying learning through Chromebooks, and that makes us very happy. I have one. Yes, Ms. Guthrie. First of all, first of all, I want to say to those students, I need to see both of you move around so that I can see. <laughs> I want you to know that tonight you have shared with us some very important information about learning in the 21st century. You are telling us, or you've told us, that you enjoy using technology and that you aren't afraid to use technology. It's user-friendly and that you feel professional uh, using technology. And I want you also to know that I know how excited young people get when they put their little fingers on one of those uh, keyboards because when I'm introducing a lesson, boys and girls are actually using the computer before I finish with my lesson because they are self-motivated. And we are very proud of you for accepting that new tool, that new learning tool and utilizing it to the best of your ability. We are very proud of you and we congratulate you and your teacher for facilitating such learning and for the superintendent of technology assistant, Ms. Cindy and Roxanne and Mr. Morado. We are so proud because <coughs> when you introduce and talk about Google documents, and how user-friendly it is. It really is. And you know, boys and girls, we want you to share that with others because we know that very, very soon, although you like the battle of the books and all of that, most of the things will be e-books. So we want you to know that we're very proud of you. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Howe. Um, not a question, so y'all can y'all can relax. This is this board talk. Um, I think this board was very thoughtful in pursuing 1.1 million dollars from the Caramont um, lease proceeds that the county commissioners were given. Um, and for the those in the room that don't know, or maybe those watching, um, there was a task force assigned, and the task force agreed with that um, with that request for the 1.1 million uh, just for Chromebooks. Uh, the county commissioners went on a limb uh, and I think did what was right and I think they did it because it was right and putting 
wireless technology in our schools so these guys can access that. Um, the difference now, and Ms. Matson, you'll agree, is that we need to get to a one-to-one -one ratio, one, one device per one student. And at $200 for a Chromebook, at 1.1 million, that works out to about 5,500 Chromebooks, give or take, you gotta buy the cart and that sort of thing. Um, and it's my understanding that the county commissioners will be acting upon that either this week or next week, if I remember right, um, a letter went out from, uh, from the chair and this board uh, encouraging them to do that. And so I would encourage you, um, if you know one of those guys, I, I can't think of a better way to spend $1.1 million right now of money that's kind of sitting there um, for the taking uh, than an immediate impact when a kid can take that Chromebook, open it up, and begin to learn. Um, and it, it ties right into what they already said is important. Uh, which is technology. So uh, if, if they opt not to approve it, I, I hope they give us a, a really good reason of why they didn't, um, because I'm going to take these two uh, to the next meeting to dress them down. So <laughs> thank you. Any other, any other comments or questions? We do thank you all very much tonight for coming. The next item on the agenda is our elementary classroom moment, and I'm going to call on Dr. Cook. Well, good evening, Chairman Lutz, <clears throat> Board of Ed members, and Superintendent Booker. Every great organization knows that to get the maximum benefit that you invest in your people, Gaston County Schools has a history of investing in its people. About three years ago, when the curriculum was changing, standards were changing, the rigor was going up. Gaston County Schools made an investment in its people. In 2014-2015, we had a group of committed educators to come together who wanted to improve mathematics instruction in Gaston County Schools. And so tonight, we found some folks who really like math. We found some folks who not only committed to themselves, to their students, but also to building their own capacity to build within their environment across Gaston County Schools. And so we found these folks, and tonight I'm pleased to share with you uh, and let uh, our outstanding mathematics K-8 instructional director, Ms. Glennis Brooks, who I know all of you are familiar with, and who's really doing a great job in her role, introduce our special guest with us tonight. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Glennis Brooks. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Good evening, Chairman Lutz, Vice Chairman Ramsey, Superintendent Booker, and members of the board. Our elementary mathematics curriculum and instruction team is honored to be here, but very proud to showcase some of the great mathematics instruction that is occurring across our schools. I am joined by our elementary curriculum and instruction, I'm sorry, curriculum facilitator, Diane Price, and she is going to share with you and give you an overview of our mathematical focus for the evening. And she is going to introduce our special guest from Catawba Heights Elementary School under the leadership of Principal Cindy Strapp. Ms. Price. Good evening. Um, it is my pleasure to be here because it is such an exciting time for you to be a student and or a teacher in this county. I, I love our Gaston County Schools. Uh, we're going to um, not show our pictures this evening because we have the real live piece with you. We brought the, we brought the real ones here with you. Okay, we are going to show them. All right, good deal. <laughs> Just kidding. There we go. All right. Um, so. Dr. Cook mentioned that we had begun this journey about three years ago, and it was an opportunity to sow into our, our teachers to, gain, to uh, improve their professional knowledge. So what you're going to take a, just a little bit of time to see is the pictures and the fruit of that as we, um, before we introduce our special guests to come show off their learning. But we provided this professional development for our teachers under what we call a coaching model. 
Um, that allowed our teachers to come together across all of our schools. They were able to grow together, study together, perfect their craft so that they were uh, able to provide a better instruction inside their classrooms for mathematics. Uh, the model then what began carried over to where we now created some master teachers and those master teachers are now going to be embedded within our schools so that all across our district we'll have an opportunity to really improve our student instruction um, that we know it's all about student achievement and um, but what we produce are going to be those learners that are able to go out and be um, those mathematicians that we intend for them to be. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight um, our guests from Catawba Heights Elementary. We have Miss Amanda Cahoon. She's a third grade teacher. She's been with Gaston County Schools for six years. She's going to share her personal experience on, her, on what her experience was with this professional development process when she was becoming this teacher coach um, and able to, and, and we're equipping her to work with our other teachers throughout the um, district and how this process has impacted her personal classroom because of course that's where she practiced her craft and improvement of her skills. She took it home into the house <laughs> with her learners and she's made a big difference there. Now she's equipped to go out and, and work with our other teachers. But she's joined by three students. It's my pleasure to is Caden Hart, Heath Monroe, and William Paget. So welcome Amanda Cahoon and students. Good evening everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you and the curriculum and instruction department for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you guys about this. It's so exciting for me. Um, training to become a math coach has been a transformative experience for me and for my classroom. Undergoing coaching training has given me the tools I need to foster a vibrant math community in my room. By using these new techniques in my teaching, I'm noticing students come to a deeper understanding of the mathematical concepts presented to them. They are able to solve the problems placed before them, but then also able to give the reasoning behind why they chose to solve those problems a certain way. I would like to present to you a task that we have been working on in our classroom. The task is to solve the problem by showing your work. On a vacation, your family travels 127 miles on the first day, 23 miles on the second day, and 40 miles on the third day. How many total miles did they travel? As you're getting your papers, I'd like to invite you to take a few moments to solve the problem. All right, the first day you travel 127 miles, the second day 23 miles, and the third day you travel 40 miles. My goal as a math teacher is to develop students who are fluent with mathematics. I want them to have such a deep understanding of the math that they can use a variety of strategies to solve problems presented to them. I would like my students to share some of the strategies they used when solving this problem. I had 127, 23, and 40. I know that 20 plus 20 is 40, and the other 40 and the other 40 equals 80. I know that 3 plus 7 is 10, and I added that to the 80, which I know is 90, and I added 90 to 100, and I know that's 190. Good. So he, what strategy did you use when you were solving this problem? Hundred tens and ones. Oh. Thank you. All right. Going to the next one. I used tallies. I, um, I left. I had twenty-seven. I left the seven, and then I saw the twenty-three, and I left the three, and then I. T um, I drove 40 because I knew 20 plus 20 equals 40, and 
I know 7 plus 3 equals 10, and then I got the 40 down here and the uh, two 20s down there. I know 20, 20 plus 20 equals 40, and there's a 40, and then I add the uh, 7 and 3 to the, uh, the, the math thing, and the, and then I plus, and then I knew that 40 plus 40 equals 80, and then I know 7 plus 3 equals 10. And I know all of that, I know this equals, all of this equals 27, all of that equals 23, and all of this equals 40, and this is 100 to make 190. Equal 190. Okay, so tell me one more time. I'll just try it. Tally more. Tally more. <laughs> So first I was breaking the numbers down. I know that 20 plus 20, that equals 40. 7 plus 3, that equals 10. And then there's no other 100, so I just broke the 100 down. And 40 plus 10, that equals 50. But there's still 100 left over, so it'd be 150. And I still haven't added the 40 to it. And I know that 50 plus 40, that equals, 100, that equals 90. And and um, there's still the 100, because there's no other 100 with the 40. And I've broken that down, and I still know that 0 plus 0, that equals still 0. And I know um, that 100 plus 90, that equals 190. Yeah. And I also use the number chart. I started with 127, because that was the biggest number. And I added 23. I added the three little dots, which every little dot counts as one. So uh, it's 127, 128, 129, 130. And then there's still the, tw the 20 left over from the 23. So 130, 140, and 150. And then I added the 40 to it, which is 150, 160, 170, 180, and 190. Thank you. Thank you. One of the most exciting things for me as a teacher is to see students making their own sense of the mathematics. <laughs> the coaching training has given me new techniques to use in my classroom to help students develop the fluency with mathematics and the deeper understanding. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you today. Thank you, are there any questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Can we go ahead and possibly get those guys signed up for a teaching certificate when they go out, <laughs> when they leave high school? I think we can. <laughs> yes, Mr. Dedman. I was just wondering. I, I love it. I, I think, uh, guys, you did a great job. Any girls in the class? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys did a good job. Yeah, Thanks. Yes, Mr. Collier. Uh, I may have missed this. What grade are they in? These are third graders. Third, third graders. Wow. Great job. Diverse learners. <laughs> STEM at its best. Thank you very much. Let's go with another round. Mr. Devin got it wrong. He needs a tutor. <laughs> I did. That's awesome. Any other comment, Ms. Cherry? May we please shake your hands? Yeah, it'd be easier. Okay. Yes, sir. And Chairman Lutz, we'd also like to recognize these fine families who are here to support these young people tonight. So please, let's give them a round of applause as well. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cook.
Our next item on the agenda is Smart Lunch, and that's an information item, and I will uh, recognize Dr. Abernathy. Good evening, Chairman Lutz, Vice Chair Ramsey, members of the board, and Superintendent Booker. Uh, while we're, we are pulling back up our presentation tonight, please allow me to introduce to you Dr. Judy Moore, our stellar principal at North Gaston High School. And Dr. Moore, uh, several months ago, engaged in something that all of our principals do, quite frankly. She had a real and frank discussion of the needs of her school with her staff and her community. And they started exploring out of the box and new ideas for how they could address those challenges or those needs. And one of the ideas that Dr. Moore and her staff identified was Smart Lunch. Um, they engaged in discussions again with parents. They sought feedback. They had surveys. They had small group and large group discussions with the staff. They reached out to school nutrition staff. Uh, they reached out to all members of their internal and external stakeholders. They even paid visits to another school that was using the Smart Lunch model. And tonight, Dr. Moore is here to share information with you on Smart Lunch. North Gaston High School will be moving forward in January and piloting this, and we're very excited about this. And so at this time, I would recognize Dr. Judy Moore, and again, we had this pulled up and we think it got bumped off, so we'll get this. We're not gonna this. talk about Google Apps for Education right now. We'll get this <laughs> back up. And we will turn it over to Dr. Moore. All right, well, I think you also have it in front of you uh, as well, but uh, Chairman Lutz, members of the board, uh, thank you for letting me come to uh, talk to you about what we're gonna be doing at North Gaston in the spring. We are very excited about it. I think the thing that I am most excited about is that this was um, an organic movement, really, from my teaching staff. Um, this was not something that actually came from me. Um, we uh, presented back in April of last year, I presented to a, a faculty meeting, um, basically the same kind of questions that, that you heard Dr. Abernathy talk about. Um, these are our issues, these are, are where we are, these are our challenges um, for our school, uh, and I sort of presented a, uh, a proposal for them um, of an idea that I had um, that I thought might work. Um, and then asked them if, uh, if they were interested in that. And this idea actually came from them. Um, Google Drive is not cooperating with me tonight. Um, oh, well, you guys have it in front of you as well? OK. Well, if you look at the first, um, if you look at the first slide, the, the how, do we, um, how do we do things is what says on the left when we can't do other things. Really the, the biggest thing that I want you to get out of that is our biggest goal is how do we improve academic performance in our graduation rate um, when our biggest, um, our biggest uh, challenge to that is really um, our, our students when it comes to what they are and are not able to do. A lot of us, um, when we need to be able to remediate with a student, uh, just like that's happened for 100 years, that happens after school or before school. That presents a big problem for our particular demographic because most of our students work. Um, a lot of our students have uh, home um, responsibilities that they need to, they might be raising younger siblings, they may be part of the family uh, finances uh, or what have you and a lot of our students work. So they really don't have the opportunity to stay after with us. That also cuts out all of your student athletes um, and your student athletes they have practice every day after school um, and students who are involved in other extracurricular activities whether it be school based or church based or whatever. We have a very difficult time getting our kids to be able to stay after school not because they don't want to but just because they can't. Um, and um, how does that work with your extracurricular activities? That's our biggest challenge. How do we, how do we get those kids to, to understand uh, the material and move forward when, when we can't get them to stay after school? Not necessarily through any fault of their own. Some of them don't want to stay after school. That's okay. Um, but then some of them do. Um, and then just can't. 
All right. Go right to left. Oh, right to left. I was trying to go up and down. Um, so here's our reality if you look at what, what is there um, when it comes to the students that are coming to us in academics. Um, and I'll really just call your attention to the, the bottom one, which is our math one. Uh, if you're familiar with EVOS, EVOS is a SAS-based program that takes the totality of students' test scores over the, the time of their uh, educational career sort of predicts what they're going to make on our biology, our English 10, and our math 1 scores. And uncannily, with whatever kind of crazy math that they're using, they're right most of the time. Um, so our predictions for our students coming in, um, and what you're looking at is last year's numbers, um, is our math 1 students, for instance, were um, our average math 1 student was predicted to be in the 34th percentile. The lowest level three, which is passing on that exam, is the 53rd percentile. And it doesn't take a lot of real math to figure that out. That means we have a lot of kids that have got some math challenges that are coming to us if our average predicted score is predicted to be a level two. We've got a lot of work to do to try to help those kids get where they need to be. Um, and the, you can see the same for biology and, and English. And if you flip to the next slide, which talks about our graduation rate, you'll note that our four-year graduation rate is not where we'd like it to be, but our five-year graduation rate is actually better than the county average. You kind of take that in totality, and what that means is we've got some kids that have got some serious academic needs that just take a little bit longer currently for them to be able to get across that stage. And we don't give up on them regardless of what our four-year uh, graduation rate looks like. We're going to get those kids across the stage. Some of them is just going to take them five years instead of four. We want to change that, but we need to be able to provide a way that we can try to catch them up easier or faster in a more, more logistically possible way than what we've been able to do. Um, and that's where Smart Lunch came from. This is where this entire conversation started last April with my staff, is how do we do that? How do, how do we change what we're doing? Because you know, I think it was Einstein that said the, the uh, textbook definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. We need to change something if we want to change what our results are. And Smart Lunch came from uh, my staff because some, were, some of them were aware of Kings Mountain High School. Some of them had come from Kings Mountain High School or had come from that county and were aware that that's what they were doing. Um, so Smart Lunch, um, we did a lot of work on it, and I'll explain to you kind of what it is. Um, a lot of professional networking. I'm the only um, principal from Gaston County who was a member of the um, Distinguished Leadership um, in Practice uh, Digital Learning Group. Um, I'm in Raleigh about once every six weeks um, with principals from all over the state um, working on digital leadership for, um, for schools coming out from the state and the new rubric and things like that. Several of them are using Smart Lunch, so it gives me the opportunity to network with them. Like Dr. Abernathy said, we went to uh, Kings Mountain, I brought a team with me, and we spent the whole day over there, and we picked the brains of um, the administration, but we also picked the brains of the kids. When we went there, we, we were not quiet, and they were good with that, which was, was excellent, because we roamed the building, we would catch random kids in the hall, we asked questions, um, and, and did all of that, talked to teachers, it was great, it was a really, uh, really good day. We brought that all back to our staff, um, got input from them, we got input from our parents, we got input from our students, and the term and the and Google form surveys there's Google Apps for education again um, and and you can see some of the comments um, one of the Kings Mountain there were several that stuck with me which is when I was putting this together one of the teachers that said I, I don't know that I would teach in a school that doesn't do smart lunch and I don't know how we ever did school before we did it this way smart they've been doing it about three years now three or four this might be the beginning of their fourth year um, but the students are the ones that really stuck with me there was one student we went into an English classroom and we just randomly asked him hey what smart lunch mean to me means to you and he, they didn't know we were coming and his answer was smart lunch means I'm graduating in, in June and we said what, what do you mean he goes I never would have gotten he goes he was sort of funny the first thing he said was I, I sort of like to procrastinate that was the first thing he said. And then he goes, but this has allowed me to make sure that I get my stuff done. And he turns around and looks at his English teacher because we were in her room at the time. So I just now finished my final paper that I need to get across the stage, and this was in April. Um, from a student who admittedly said it wouldn't have happened if not for Smart Lunch. We heard that story several times um, as we were talking to students. So we got stakeholder input from everyone. Um, the part that surprises me the most, I've been doing the principal job anyway. This is the beginning of my 10th year, I think, uh, as a principal. And um, I've never in my entire existence had the entire staff 100% on board with the same idea. There's not a single dissenter. And maybe this comes from the fact that it was their idea, and I sort of ran with it and pulled them with it to begin with. But this was their idea to begin with. 
Um, so what is kind of smart lunch? I'll kind of give you the real short, short version. It's just a different way to structure the time that we have. Um, we're going to shave a couple of minutes off of our first, second, and third, uh, first, second, third, and fourth period. We're going to shave some time off of our, um, right now we have a six minute class change, which is really plenty of time. They can actually get to class a whole lot faster than that. We're going to shave some, uh, shave some time off of that and, and use the existing schedule that we have to basically build in an hour long lunch period. And in this hour long lunch period, the entire school goes to lunch at the same time, which is totally scary to think about when you put it out there the first time, which is why we spent so much time researching it and watching how it worked. That's why I wanted to see it in action at, at Kings Mountain to see how it actually worked. But inside that hour long period, there are two remediation periods. There's a 25 minute one in the beginning and a 25 minute one in the end. So um, teachers are required to do tutorials which would normally be what they do after school, so they're excited about this because it keeps them from having to stay after school as well. Um, and they do tutorials twice a week. They can require kids to come to those tutorials. Kings Mountain requires every student who's failing to go to their uh, whatever their tutorial is. After that, the teachers kind of have discretion. Um, it's flexible with our PLCs. If, if the post-test data says they didn't get this particular concept, well, maybe that's what they do remediation on, and those particular kids are the ones that come. A lot of flexibility in who you can bring in in those two different tutorials. So a student can go to tutorial and then they can go eat lunch. Or they can go eat lunch and then they can go to a tutorial. Not all of our students need remediation. So what happens with the rest of them? What else do they do? Um, the gyms are open and they're staffed. The computer labs are open and they're staffed. Our media center is open and it's staffed, um, just like Kings Mountain was. There was a student in there that, and that, that, that stuck with me and I saw the same comment and it's listed on, on your uh, presentation from one of the students that we asked. Um, we happened to be one of the random ones we talked to in their media center and said, what do you think about Smart Lunch? And she said, oh, I love it. I'm like, well, why do you love it? She goes, well, this is like my computer in the library. And we said, why is that? She says, well, because all my teachers are on Google Docs. All of my teachers are on Google Docs. We all operate Google Classrooms. Even I have a Google Classroom because that's how they turn in their lesson plans to me and I give them feedback on them, um, which is what I was doing before I came here tonight. Um, and what she said to us was is that all my teachers are all, this is all web-based stuff. We're working on all this stuff and all this technology in the classroom, which is great, except I don't have internet at home. Neither do all of my kids. Like most of my kids do, an astounding number of my kids do, or they have it on their phone um, with the data from a smartphone, but not all of our kids are connected at home. She said to us very clearly, this is where I do my work. I come during lunch, I go grab something to eat, I come, I do my work here, and I don't ever have to take anything home and I always get it done because she just does it during smart lunch. Um, we heard that several times. Um, so that's kind of what it is. It also gives our counselors the chance to do small groups. Um, we have kids that need small group counseling. Our counseling staff doesn't have any time during the day to do that unless they're pulling them out of a class that they need to be in, which is not an ideal situation. Gives them the opportunity to do that. Gives us the opportunity to bring in um, speakers. Could be motivational speakers to have in the auditorium during smart lunch. Go watch it if you want to. Um, UNCC was coming to Kings Mountain the day after we were there to talk about um, how to apply. Uh, CFNC was coming, this is how you fill your stuff out. Kids could go down there during their smart lunch for that if they wanted to do that as well. So it is sort of an open campus kind of option for that hour for kids to take some responsibility either with their, um, with their classes or with what else it is that they're doing. Or maybe just to de-stress and shoot some baskets during the middle of the day because if you're anything like me around two o'clock you hit a wall. So do our kids. <laughs> and so sometimes that's a good thing. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking to do. We've put a whole lot of work into planning it. We've got some more work on the horizon. We're putting some committees together that include our parents and our students um, to make sure that they are involved in the actual um, planning and training, which is we found is one of the most important things that we have to do that Kings Mountain harped on, that you really have to train your students in how to do this and how to do it right. Um, before you roll it out and then we're looking to do this starting in January and the best part for me because I'm a nerd like that is that we will have a semester of data where we haven't done smart lunch this year with the same set of kids apples to apples same kids same classes and whatever uh, and what have you and I'll have their proficiency data and I'll have their test score data and I'll have their their um, passing rates and things like that. And then next semester, when we start this with the same group of kids in the same kind of classes, same curriculum, I'll be able to use that kind of data comparatively uh, to see if it makes uh, a difference, because that's one of those things that I really probably am nerdy for enjoying, but I like it a lot. So that's, uh, that's something that we're planning on doing in uh, January. Um, so I'll be happy to take any questions you have. I know it's out of the box and it's different. Um, so you may have questions. Mr. Dadman. I have one. Yes, sir. <laughs> First of all, Dr. Board, I think this is really a neat idea. Really good. 
I mean, I really like it. Two things I'm curious about. Are you going to allow your children to use their personal devices during that time, their phones or their iPads? Yes, we're a BY we piloted BYOD last year, so we're already at BYOD. And the second school. thing is, who keeps up with the logistics of the whole thing? I mean, is there one person that keeps up with? You know what our English teachers doing and social studies teacher. I mean, who, who does that? Well, that's part. There's a schedule that Kings Mountain put out that is on every teacher's door. Um, that uh, we're planning on following that same sort of model. And in Google Apps for for education, that's actually very easy for us to keep up with because we can put that whole sheet out to everyone, so the whole staff can see the same thing at the same time. So that's actually not as much to manage as you would think so it would be. So it's another good use of Google. Oh yeah, and we are definitely a Google-driven school. And I can say what, he wasn't lying when he said that we were, uh, the Gaston County was on the cutting edge. Being in that DLP group in Raleigh every six weeks or so, I can tell you when it comes to this especially, Gaston County is on the cutting edge of that. Because a lot of the things that we talk about, when I mentioned Google Classroom at one of our meetings, maybe two or three meetings ago, only like three or four other people even heard of it. Because Google Classroom only just rolled out last year. Um, and we're already on top of it. And my last thing is, mm -hmm. have you already told the students this is going to start? They, they were aware. We did a lot of survey data with them last year, so they know we're talking about it. And then we talked about it at the beginning of the year because that was their first question. Are we doing this or are we not doing this? Like, what are we doing? So we, to we, told, the, um, we told the classes in our opening meeting that it's something that we were going to be putting committees on to get all the structure in place, and we would start at second semester. Did you involve some students in it also? Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Good job. Yes, yes Mr. Chair. I'm sure you've thought this through. I'm just curious, though. Um, I would assume that, that you have staggered lunches now. Yes. How is your cafeteria staff going to be able to handle them at one time? Well, and we have talked about that, and we've actually talked to Frank Fields and brought in. We, we met with School Nutrition about this as well. One of the, and that was one of the things I wanted to see at Kings Mountain, like how does that work? Because they're a comparable size school to, to what we are. We've got about 1,120, and they're at about 1,300. Um, and that's what I wanted to see. The whole school goes to lunch at the same time. And really how it works out, and what a lot of the students told us at Kings Mountain, is that they, they may all go to lunch at the same time, but they all don't go to the lunch line at the same time. The lunch is open for that whole hour. So there are students that might go to tutorials first or go okay. to the auditorium, and then they go get lunch 35 <coughs> minutes later. So they serve the whole hour, as opposed to only serving that, that 15 minutes at the beginning of each staggered lunch and then shutting the door and then waiting for the next group. Okay. So it worked well. That was one of the things I wanted to watch when we went to Kings Mountain. Thank you. Any other questions? I think that's an excellent program, and I think we'll be excited to hear what you have to say later in the year when you've actually seen it work, and hopefully we can expand it to other high schools. I hope so, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is driver education update, and I will ask uh, Dr. Baltnight to come forward. Good evening, members of the board, Chairman Lutz, Superintendent Booker. I have a brief update. As you will recall, we have talked for quite some time about driver's education and the unknown about it with being supported through the state. We're happy to report that the state has decided to fund it. And thanks to all of you, we actually maintained driver's ed programming while that was in influx at the state level. So I want to thank you on behalf of the children of Gaston County, because remember, we provide driver's education to all students in the county, not just our students. And so we never stopped driver's education classes or on the road training while we were waiting to find out if it was going to be funded. And that's because you told us to move forward and support those students. You agreed a couple of months ago that we would begin on September 1st, charging $25 per student for driver's education. Those fees are being collected as of September the 1st on the first day of the class that the students take. And again, the rationale for that was to make sure that parents and students understood the importance of signing up and committing to that time slot so that other children that were waiting could have the opportunity in a timely manner, but also to offset the cost of the driver's education program to the district. Some people have said since driver's education is now funded at the state level, why are you continuing to charge? I want to remind everyone that prior to the 
unknown about driver's education. Other districts were charging as much as $65. So we are still on the low end of what we're charging across the district, state, I'm sorry. And there are 72 school systems that charge for driver's education, ranging from $25 to $65. So we're on the low end of that fee. But again, it costs us additional funds to provide driver's education to all the students in the county. If you attend school in Gaston County or live in Gaston County, you get driver's education in our district. We also have put in place as a part of the requirement with the new driver's education funding that if there's a child that can't afford to pay the $25 fee, we're using a waiver form. The waiver form was adapted from the SAT, ACT form that we already use in our district. We pull that from our school counselor's office. So any child that can't afford to pay the fee for SAT or ACT, they get a waiver. So we'll use that same process for this waiver for our students. The other piece that we're doing to make sure that it's consistent across the district, we're sending someone out from my office office to go to each school site to collect the $25 to make sure the questions are being asked the same consistently so that if a child has an issue they're being taken care of as well. Any questions? Questions about driver's education? The only, I don't have a question, I just have a statement. Um, there's a couple of us here that are still on the board that would like to thank Dr. Balt Knight for the smooth process that we have with driver's education because it's been many years since I've received a terrible call about driver's education, and I used to get them very frequent. Thank you. Thank you. We have a great Mr. staff Collier. that takes care of that. I'd like to echo that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were uh, two common complaints on this board, and, uh, and some of you heard me joke is uh, the um, one of them is the, the, the process in which we choose cheerleaders, and the next one was driver's education. And uh, the driver's education one has just uh, not been a complaint for years, and I'd like to echo Mr. Lute's comments on that is thank you, thank you, thank you, because the phone used to ring off the hook about driver's education. <laughs> I'd like to say that Mr. Duncan could not be here this evening. As you know, he's also our director of athletics, Mr. Collier, to your point. And so he could not be here tonight, but he's been very uh, helpful in communicating with the principals. He personally called every high school principal to let them know about how we we're going to handle the fees and that we were sending someone out from our office. So that has gone extremely smooth for our district. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Howe? Dr. Bowen, I know in the, in the past year and a half or so, I haven't had any complaints about driver's education. I have had complaints a few complaints about people trying to trying to reach the person who's in charge of whatever school trying to get their child signed up and that sort of thing um, and I'm assuming that if they're having to pay $25 now that there's automatically a greater expectation of customer service on that side so uh, what has been the experience this year already with the people who are providing it one have they stayed flat with their rate that they're charging us and are they are you getting good feedback on their customer service to to our parents and our students. Good questions, Mr. Howe. We, as you uh, may recall, we have a we do a bid process. So they're still in the bid process for three years. We're on year two of that. So we have the same uh, driving school that we've had for previous years. The other thing that we've done is we have centralized more of the process so that as parents call, they're an outside third party provider. I want them to call our staff. So that's the purpose of someone from our office going out to the schools to collect the funds, and then they'll be referred back to our office so that they're getting the same message from across the district and also not to put that on the schools because we don't have staff to put out in each school. So we are continuing to work on that to improve the communication so that parents know to communicate with us. If there's an issue, then we can resolve it directly with the NC Driving School. Okay. Yes, Mr. Debman. Dr. Ball Knight, do they still provide a person for four hours a day at each high school? driver's ed people? No, sir. We actually use that as one of our cost-saving measures in this process so that we can streamline because that was one of the concerns is that a coordinator is at one school site giving different information than the other. So again, to provide that controlled environment, we're sending someone out from our office and then they will take those phone calls. They'll go meet with the parent. They'll so address issues. Be better because I never had a problem when that person was at our school. I mean, he handled or she handled every driver's ed problem. They were only there uh, three hours a day. But right. They, Yes, sir. So we your do staff is doing that now, so there's nobody there from the driver's education company that's staying there. That is correct, because as you state, they weren't there every day, all day. So on those days when no one was there at certain schools, then there would be messages or concerns. So we don't want people to have to wait because we're here every day, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. So we think that we can manage that better. Any other comments or questions? 
seeing no other questions, thank you again, and you're doing a great job. Thank you. The next two items on our agenda will be uh, the first is adoption of the 2015-16 Gaston County School budget resolution, and that's an action item. And the last item will be capital report. And Mr. Hoskins is with us to present both of these. Uh, members of the board, <coughs> Superintendent Booker. I'm here finally to <laughs> <laughs> present the budget for your approval. I believe you should have received a budget resolution uh, with the board book. Uh, it's in the same format that, that DPI prescribes and that it's been in for a number of years. A few things I'd like to go over. Uh, first of all, some changes and in new initiatives uh, from last year to this year, some of the major items. Uh, first of all, the impact of inflation. Obviously, inflation has been low, but when you talk about a $271 million budget, even a 2% inflation rate does have an impact on your budget. Also, the continued use of technology in our classrooms. We've talked a lot about that today, and a lot of the technology that we already have in there, uh, we need to maintain it and replace it if it's at end of life. Also, the state-mandated uh, $750 one-time bonus, that will be paid by the state for state uh, employees. However, we have a few hundred local employees, and that will impact our local budget. Uh, making teacher pay more competitive, we've talked about this probably since January, and this was one of the key uh, items that the board decided to, uh, to address in, in this year's budget, and that will in include about a 10% increase in the local teacher supplement effective July 1st. Uh, improving literacy in our elementary schools and also school consolidation. So when we look at the numbers for these items, uh, the biggest item, as you see, is the salary supplement uh, for teachers. Again, that's about a 10% increase across the board, which uh, translates to about a million dollars. Uh, some of the other items, the other largest item is extended school year. Uh, we started that this summer, so we took some of that expense, I guess, in July of this year. Uh, the state is stepping up and doing what we did last year, and that's funding first grade and second grade. Uh, so that's about 400000 a uh, smart board projector and bulb replacement. About three or four years ago, this board and the county commissioners and, and I think it's the Harper Family Trust invested a lot of money for our schools, our classrooms to get uh, the smart boards and the smart board technology at a cost of about $1,500 a piece. Some of those are starting to, to move out of warranty and we're having to replace those and this is the incremental cost uh, for, for maintaining those projectors in all the classrooms. And then, as I mentioned, the employee one-time bonus, uh, $750 would be about $200,000 this year. So about just under $2 million impact from last year to this year. Also looking at the budget summary, really no surprises here. The first slide here is a pie chart uh, with our sources of revenue. As you can see, the biggest piece of the pie is the state, and that's why the state budget was so important to us. Uh, it's about 60% of our revenues. Uh, the second largest is the county. The county funding was flat from last year to this year at about $44 million. That represents about 16% of our revenues. And federal is about uh, $20 million, which is about 7% of our revenues. So as far as the percentage of our revenues, no real big changes from last year to this year, but just wanted to, to make you aware of this. Uh, on the expenditures, the largest uh, expenditure is instructional services, uh, 66%. That represents the actual instruction that goes on in a school for the children. So this is, this is our bread and butter, and this is where the, the bulk of our money goes. 178 million of the 271 million uh, goes in instructional services. Uh, in addition, uh, operational support, that's where you see maintenance, custodians, utilities, all of that support uh, is in that $25 million. Other support services, uh, that's student support uh, for guidance, media, et cetera, uh, that's about $11 million. And child nutrition uh, is 
$17 million. So again, these are fairly consistent with what they've been in the past, uh, but just wanted you to be able to, to see this. Uh, and finally, when we look at a budget, budget comparison, <coughs> this shows last year's initial budget compared to this year's initial budget. The big change that will jump out at you is the state public school fund, uh, up $4.1 million, 2.6%. Most of this, or a substantial portion of this, has to deal with the increase in teacher salaries. We've talked about the beginning teachers going from 33,000 to 35,000. That's where this, this money comes into play. And, and teacher salaries is probably 80 million of this 160 million. So it is a huge component of that, and that's where a lot of this increase comes from. Uh, also, you probably noticed child nutrition is down $1.1 million. Last year they changed, uh, the USDA implemented some new nutrition guidelines that resulted in reduced sales and so that is reflected uh, in this year's budget uh, from the state and federal government. On the expense side, uh, again instructional services, that's where our teachers are. You can see our uh, projected expen expenditures this year are about 5.2 million higher than they were last year, which is right just above 3%, just over the rate of inflation. Um, other payments, 42%, that's really, a lot of that is indirect cost payments, so it's really payments from the federal government to us that goes back to our local, so it's, it's not, it's sort of a wash. Um, and finally, child nutrition, you can see down 6.9%, again, due to reduced sales. So. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I will entertain any questions you may have. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. Questions or comments, Mr. Howe? Two questions, Mr. Hoskins. One, we know that they took away the flexibility of teacher uh, or uh, of TA funding, Correct. Um, and that was going to impact us financially. Where, because I don't see it in here, where are we making that money up at? How are we covering that impact? And the second thing was, I know they're doing the $750 um, bonus for teachers. There's normally been in December, I think, time frame, uh, a teacher's assistant uh, bonus that was in there too. Or is that going to be a wash and they won't get that this year? Do they get that this year? Can you explain that? So um, those two items. To the first point, uh, the teacher assistant funding and teacher funding is all in this instructional services because those are uh, employees that are in the classroom that are instructing our, our kids. So we move it from one bucket, the TA bucket last year, to the teacher bucket. Um, it did not impact this instructional services. Now if you dig on down about four or five layers into the, into the budget, it, it does impact that. So to your point, last year we made one move to get about $2 million from teacher assistant funding to teacher funding. This year, we're going to do the same thing, but it's going to be about a half a dozen to a dozen moves, but it's going to have the same impact. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but they're both instructional services expenditures. Well, a follow-up question to that then. If we're digging five layers down and we're pulling something to compensate for that, what are we losing out on downstream? Because if we're taking water from one bucket, one bucket's going to be less. So what is that bucket? What, what are we losing? Well, we're not losing. We're Whenever we take one dollar from one pocket and stick it in the other pocket, we don't lose the dollar, it's just we have to spend it a different way. So what we're doing, or what we did in the past, was take those dollars from teacher assistant funding and put it in teacher funding. We can't do that now. So now what we have to do is we have other teacher assistants in other buckets, in other departments. So now we're going to have to gather all those teacher assistants from other departments and put them in that teacher assistant funding bucket to fill up that two million that we normally, whoops, sorry, that we normally move to teachers. So then we'll have to take other expenditures to fill up those other buckets. So we're just moving money from one bucket to another bucket, we're not losing money. I know it's confusing and I hope that answers your question. <laughs> And then to the other question on the if I could interject sure. one thing, <clears throat> the great thing that the House did was they left the line item fully funded, which is what Gary's getting to. It allowed the dollars, and so 
our auditors will say this is approved the way you can allocate these funds. It won't be that we get to arbitrarily do it. The state will also give us guidelines on how you can meet the requirement that's been assigned through the legislation. So it's not a matter of, of getting down and sh shuffling it. It's just how you account for it and which categories you put it in because our budget has 001 as a teaching, but within that it has multiple layers inside that. And so I just want to clarify that as we looked at that. So the best thing for us, and we do thank particularly the House and the way they looked at the budget, it was fully funded. It, had it been a cut, it would have been different. But basically this year we came in counting on 50 teachers, that's additional teachers that we use for classroom size, would be funded through the TA line item, and we'll just have to fund that through other line items. To help. Okay. Question two. Could you repeat that, please? I'm sorry. <laughs> Question two was that I, I think it's the December time frame, if, I, if my memory serves right. Teachers' assistants got a bonus. Um, I know they're doing all teachers' bonuses this year. So, with teachers' assistants, are they in that same $750 bonus? And then, is there an, an additional bonus for teachers' assistants in December, or because the states? kind of funded that, there's going to be a, a watch there. I don't know, that's what I'm asking. All employees that are active employees on November 1st will get the $750 bonus, regardless of whether you're the superintendent, a teacher, or finance officer, or whatever. Um, to your question, every year in November, classified employees get a 3% bonus, is that correct? Yep. So they would still be entitled to that bonus. Okay, so that one still happened. That's the question. Yeah, Mr. Howe, that, that has a long history. That was a local decision uh, a number of years ago that in lieu of a one-time pay increase, they, they being the association we were working with said we would prefer it in a one-time payment and it's typically done in November and so that is still in our budget. Okay. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Hoskins? This is a action item, and this adoption will be needed, will be, I will need that put in the form of a motion. Yes, Ms. Chair. Um, All right. Uh, Ms. Guthrie has seconded. Any discussion, any more discussion? Mr. Hoskins, we are so glad to see you again tonight. <laughs> We're kind of going to miss you next week. That's right. Before you, you call the, <laughs> the vote, Mr. Lutz. Yeah, I, I have a question, Mr. Lutz. Okay, yes. go ahead. Mr. Collier? Well, I was going to wrap. Up. Well, um, I, I do have one question. Um, I, I noticed that our funding to charter schools have gone up. And um, I, I just want to be clear. There's a lot a lot's been talked about in the House and the Senate in legislation we're having to let the money follow the student regardless of where they go even if out of state uh, that's I, I, I struggle with that decision but right. um, I don't know of any that we have out of state we certainly have a number out of district in Mecklenburg and Lincoln County uh, the, <coughs> the reason it went up fifty thousand dollars is Last year was the initial budget, and at the time we did the initial budget last year, we didn't have all the, uh, the enrollment numbers for the charter schools, so we actually paid about $2.3 million last year. Uh, so we will pay about $2.3 million this year unless, you know, when we get the final uh, enrollment numbers for charter schools, they went up more than we expected. So, uh, Speaking of enrollment numbers, when are those due? I know that uh, ours are due the 20th day of school. Are they held accountable? like we are as far as the attendance are the, the they are but it takes DPI a while to gather all the 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 uh, LEAs and the charter schools and to, to get all that stuff together and crank out the numbers and tell us what we owe it's usually uh, October November when we get those numbers and help me how does someone know in Raleigh I guess that's where they track this and decide where the money flows right yes um, that I live in Gaston County and I'm attending a charter school, say, in Cleveland County. How do they know that I'm not moved? 
Well, it, it could happen. We actually had a few students that claimed to be in Gaston County that were actually in Lincoln County, and so we went back to Lincoln County and got reimbursed for, I don't, can't remember, it was a handful of, of children this year. So we do, tr do test that uh, from time to time, so, but certainly some could fall through the cracks. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Booker. Mr. Booker. Uh, just as uh, one of you was beginning to make the comment, this has been an arduous process, and you need to think about the burden that went across the district and applaud some people who have done a great job. As Ms. Dr. Balknight just spoke to you, you made a decision to not slow down driver's education. We're going to provide it. You continued providing it. And so we're not having any kind of bump or, or hiccup. Well, you made other decisions like that. We did not ever send a notice to a teacher assistant that their job was in jeopardy. And as I have toured schools, I have gotten much feedback or thank yous for that. So your leadership there was appreciated. Mr. Hoskins' team has had to manage instances because when we get a budget like this, we have to cut back in the school. So we only allocate them percentages of what we think the final budget will be. And then his department has to deal with the one-offs and the request. An assistant superintendent will come saying, I've identified this issue, we've got to address it. So the stress goes through that. So we appreciate you approving this budget tonight so that we can start cleaning up and getting on with the business of schools. But we are a big business. You heard that big $200 million number, 4,000 people interacting with your children. We, we always talk about 3,800 employees. That didn't count all these contract driver ed contracts and things that we had. We were a big organization, and this budget was a really stressful time, but your support allowed us to move forward, and now we'll take the cards that have been given to us, and we'll start to use them to educate all the children. So oh, we just appreciate the support you've given us in this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Booker. Any other comment or discussion? I've got a motion and I've got a second. I'm all in favor. And it is unanimous. Thank you very much. Mr. Hoskins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just here to do a uh, informational item on capital improvement. Um, if I can get this to work. Sorry. Um, just as an update, uh, we've been starting to talk about capital planning a lot. This slide, I believe, actually was presented three years ago or two years ago to the board. Uh, talking about a capital plan and what needs to be included in the capital plan, you know, we need to make sure we not only talk about new construction, but also about repairs for our existing facilities. Uh, and also talk about the life cycle of some of these large electrical uh, systems that we have, such as HVAC and also roof, and also talk about student capacity and population trend data. In arriving at a capital plan, the, one of the first things we need to do is define a vision and goal and a common standard for our school facilities, uh, perform an assessment of the existing facilities. We've done that on 13 already. Uh, again, assess the capacity and population and finally establish priorities. And I think that's really going to be the key is, is digging through all this data and trying to find out what's the biggest $50 million worth of needs that we have in the school system or whatever that number is that, that we decide on. And just as a snapshot of what we're looking at, you know, we do have 54 schools. We actually have 55, but one is, is at Gaston College. We have 11 support facilities, over 200 buildings, almost 5 million square feet of office space. And, and as we've said many times, almost 60% of our facilities are 40 years or older. So we have some, some aging facilities, and that's going to be a key factor in, in developing this capital plan. As I mentioned earlier, we did do last year an assessment of 13 schools that were located throughout the county. Uh, I have them listed here. I won't read them because we've talked about this uh, before, but it's all the way from Cherryville to Belmont and across the county. And in doing that assessment, it was a very, um, a very thorough assessment. It looked at the outside of the facilities, the handicap accessibility, parking, the interior, the, the 
condition of the electrical systems, et cetera. So it was a very uh, thorough and specific uh, assessment that we had on those 13 schools. Also, just looking back 25 years or so, just looking at some of the bond history that we've had uh, over the last several years, uh, you can see back in 1992, almost 60 million all the way to 2003, about 6.8 million. Concentrating on our most recent uh, bond issuance was the two, 2007 bonds that were issued, 175 million in bonds. Uh, the county did the first issue in 2009, which totaled $80 million. And the primary function of that $80 million was to build Stuart Kramer High School, to perform some significant renovations to Hunter Huss, and also to purchase a Hawk's Nest Intermediate School. And after doing all that, we had about $8.5 million in savings. So the county commissioners repurposed those funds and allowed us to use those monies uh, for our existing facilities. And there's currently 95 million remaining unissued of this $175 million bond issue. And if you'll recall, I think the board, uh, the commissioners extended this uh, 95 million another three years or so. Uh, but hopefully we plan to get 50 million or so to build the two new schools, the elementary and middle school. But in looking at the eight and a half million, again, these are schools located throughout the district and it's the various needs. Uh, we were given four million in roofing. Uh, most of the roofing projects have been completed. Uh, we still have Cherryville High School in progress, uh, New Hope Elementary in progress, and Warlick will be done uh, later this year or early next year. Also two and a half million in plumbing. Uh, almost all the plumbing projects are completed with the exception of Chavis and Friday and those will be done or scheduled to be done next summer. Uh, life safety, we have completed all of that. That was our top priority to, to get that million dollars out into the schools and get those projects complete. Uh, we've done intercom projects for about five schools, fire alarms for five schools and some cameras for four other schools. And the additional million or remaining million is in engineering and, and design fees and we, we use that to, uh, to fund uh, the soft costs for these projects that we just talked about. So with that, as, as we see it, our next steps are setting the vision and goals and setting a common standard for our facilities, updating and prioritizing our existing capital needs and population trend data. And then also we have to complete a state mandated uh, facility needs survey and that will be instrumental in helping us to uh, identify the needs of the school system as a whole. And this is required every five years. So uh, I think this is due next January. So we'll be working on that here shortly. And that is all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hoskins. I'm sure we should have some comments or questions about all this. Uh, it's a lot of information. Uh, a lot of the board members that are here today have saw most of this uh, take shape and uh, been through the process, And uh, but some of you have not, and uh, some of you have seen some of the stuff that has just gotten done in the last year or so. So any questions or comments? Yes, Mr. Howe. Uh, I'm noticing on the, the bond money, the remained in bond money, there's uh, – an estimated 45 million that'd be left set to say estimated because we don't know build cost yet of the middle school and the elementary school um, I, I would like for this board to take into consideration maybe push it to the facilities committee the commissioners have been very clear that on the bond money from 2007 that it was for building schools um, not repairing schools and that sort of thing and, and I do believe that this board will have to take up an issue soon about bonds of repairing what we have uh, because at $130 million, that's a big elephant. But there's still a remainder estimated of $45 million um, that we haven't asked for. Um, one of the things on whatever slide number this is with the 2014 assessments, the first school on there, um, just because it's alphabetical, is Belmont Middle. It is also the oldest school we have. Um, South Point Township, that area is in dire need of a middle school. Um, and I think that this board would be wise and. Uh, maybe the chair would like to push that to the facilities committee of uh, pursuing building another middle school uh, in that Belmont area uh, just because that one is so far behind compared to everything else. 
um, and so we don't get ourselves in trouble. I, I stated in the in the meeting with the task force when we asked for three million to buy property for some school um, that the county's already hired an extra uh, inspector for all the building going on in the Belmont area. Um, so that problem is only getting worse, not better. And uh, if they're only going to release that money for a build, uh, I think we'd be smart to go capitalize on getting it um, and really working with the county commissioners and providing something in that area that, that is way beyond needed. So just a thought. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Howell. Mr. Collier? Um, I, I just want to remind everybody <clears throat> who uh, may not have been on the board at the time or, uh, or may not know that that 2007 bond included money for a new middle school, an additional middle school in the eastern part of the county. Um, we're talking about a replacement, and Mr. Howell makes a good point about the growth, but that bond was passed for a new middle school, an additional one, and because we knew the growth was coming. Now, things got postponed somewhat during the recession, but uh, we're kind of right back where we were when we passed the bond. The growth is coming, and um, I, I agree with Mr. Howell. I, I don't think the need has changed because the growth, is, an additional school needs to be built. Uh, and uh, that, that's something this board needs to really look hard at in the eastern part of that county and, and what's happening with growth because uh, that bond money was for, intended for a new additional middle school. Uh, Belmont Middle, we never talked about replacing it until we started looking at the age of our buildings and uh, saw the need that all our middle schools need to be replaced. But um, I just wanted to remind everybody what the 2007 bond was about. Okay, thank you, Mr. Collier. Um, I think that's something that, that probably really needs to have a little more in-depth discussion at your facilities committee. I think we, you and I have talked a little bit about this in different avenues, uh, different ways to go, uh, but I think this board would, would in, entertain uh, your committee your committee's thought as y'all go in depth a little more with uh, the facts and the numbers from all the, our other departments here at the central office. And um, I think this board would would uh, look forward to your recommendation from your committee. Any other questions or comments? Okay. I see no other questions or comments on that. Do I have... Uh, any other motions, Mr. Collier? Mr. Chair, no other uh, with no other business, I move to adjourn. I have a motion for adjournment. A second from Mr. Ramsey. Any discussion? All in favor? All right. We're adjourned.